Okay, um, well, uh, can I welcome everybody to uh, this fantastic event? Uh, I want to thank you for joining us at the Centre for Innovative Justice at RMIT University for the launch of our exciting new online resource, supportingjustice.net. Uh, of course, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, um, and I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present. And it really is a very important day because today is National Sorry Day. Um, National Sorry Day is where we remember and acknowledge the mistreatment and the grief and indeed uh, the suffering uh, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who were forcibly removed from their families and their communities. Uh, we also should remember that starting tomorrow is uh, National Reconciliation Week. Um, reconciliation is a very important journey for all Australians as individuals, as families, as communities and as organisations and importantly for us as a nation. So uh, it is appropriate that we are uh, meeting at this particular time uh, during um, National, Reconcilia uh, National Reconciliation Week and on National Sorry Day. Uh, I am very proud to be introducing to you supportingjustice.net. It is a fantastic new resource for court and legal professionals to access the resources they need to support people with uh, disability in the criminal justice system. Very shortly, I'll be uh, joined by the Honourable Luke Donnellan, Minister for Disability, to, to formally launch this website. But first, I just want to address a couple of uh, housekeeping matters. Uh, today, we're using Microsoft Teams um, live to connect with you uh, safely. Uh, helping with the back end, we have uh, Michael and Heidi from the CIJ, so if anything goes wrong, you can blame them. Uh, after hearing from uh, the Minister, we'll introduce our expert panel who will be discussing some of the issues confronting people with disability in the criminal justice system. And at the end of their discussion, there'll be some time for the panel to answer questions from the audience. Uh, to submit your questions uh, for the panel, please type them into the Q&A chat function and Michael and Heidi will be able to put them through to the panel. Uh, I want to remind you that this event is being uh, recorded and we intend to share the recording and uh, transcript. Uh, so if you haven't already done so, you can sign on uh, for the CIJ's newsletter to be kept uh, up to date, and that's at cij.org.au. So a bit of background to the project. Um, today we're launching supportingjustice.net. It's a new online resource which provides resources to support people with disability in our criminal justice system. Uh, when the Centre for Innovative Justice was established in uh, 2013. The Enabling Justice Project, which was a partnership with Jesuit Social Services through the Office of Public Advocate, uh, was one of the very first projects we committed to. The project was launched in response to some devastating statistics. Uh, while people with acquired brain injury represent less than 3% of the general population, a breathtaking 42% of men and 33% of women in our prisons have an acquired brain injury. These are extraordinary statistics. In other words, the proportion of people uh, with ABIs in custody is dramatically higher than the wider population. An imbalance that is echoed in incarceration rates of people with disabilities generally. Given the significant overlap between the risk factors for sustaining an ABI and the social and economic drivers for becoming involved in the criminal justice system, it should be crystal clear for policymakers by now that the same challenges which make people with ABIs vulnerable to disadvantage uh, like homelessness, mental illness, poverty and unemployment also make them vulnerable to contact with the justice system. Despite this, the prevalence and even existence of ABI is not well known or indeed understood across the justice system. The Enabling Justice Project found that fragmented and inconsistent responses across the justice, disability and social service systems mean that the needs of people with disability are rarely recognised, rarely respected 
and uh, rarely responded to appropriately. The website we're launching today has been developed to respond to some of those findings and is part of the CIJ's broader supporting justice project, which is working to achieve systemic change to address overrepresentation. So to develop the website, the project team at CIJ worked with uh, Paper Giant to include people from across the criminal justice, disability and social service systems to contribute to the design and indeed the functionality of this very important resource. Critically, the team worked closely with people with disability and lived experience in the justice system. I, I guess my long term in government uh, taught me that though good ideas and information are crucial, there is no more powerful source of information about an injustice than hearing it from those who have actually lived it. The project team adopted a human centred design approach uh, to developing this website. And I've got to say, we're extremely fortunate to have self-advocate Dorothy Armstrong as part of the project team to ensure that lived experience informed every stage of this resources uh, development. Let me tell you, there are very few things more transformative, I've got to say, than listening to Dorothy Armstrong, and I look forward to uh, hearing from her on the panel very shortly. So supportingjustice.net has been designed to raise awareness of disability in the criminal justice system, promote the use of supports available for people with disability, and to provide practical guides and resources to criminal justice system workers to much better support people with a disability. To demonstrate some of the features of the website, we've put together a short video uh, walking you through the Supporting Justice uh, .net site and we'll play that for you now. All going well. Welcome to SupportingJustice.net, an online resource developed by the Centre for Innovative Justice at RMIT University and Paper Giant. This website has been designed for court and legal professionals to help them better support people with cognitive disability in the criminal justice system. SupportingJustice.net includes information about disability in the criminal justice system, practical guides and resources for court and legal professionals, people with disability and their supporters, information on services and programs, and the personal stories of people with disability who have had lived experience of the criminal justice system. People with disability are significantly overrepresented in our criminal justice system. The facts section of supportingjustice.net includes introductory information on acquired brain injury, autism spectrum disorder, dual disability and intellectual disability. It includes an introduction to recognising the signs of disability and links to further reading and resources. People with disability often feel overlooked and unsupported in the criminal justice system. The personal stories section includes profiles of Tom and Poppy from the Centre for Innovative Justice and the Jesuit Social Services Enabling Justice Project. Following their stories, the page includes links to resources on the website that have been designed to respond to the lived experiences of people like Poppy and Tom. People with disability, lawyers, court staff and judicial officers were all involved in developing the resources on supportingjustice.net. Under resources for lawyers, judicial officers and court professionals, you can find practical guides and downloads to help you better support people with disability in the criminal justice system. These practical guides include information on accessing the National Disability Insurance Scheme, effective communication with people with disability, and a preparing for court form to help people with disability better prepare for their first meeting with their lawyer. Supportingjustice.net includes a downloadable workshop kit which can be adapted to support professionals wanting to prepare professional learning activities and promote disability awareness in their organisations. People with disability, support workers and clinical staff can find it difficult knowing how best to prepare for court. Supportingjustice.net includes practical guides to getting legal advice, finding support and preparing for court. Under services and programs, supportingjustice.net includes a guide with contact information for support and disability services relevant to people with disability in the criminal justice system. This page includes links to other service directories such as Ask Izzy, as well as specific information on court dates, the NDIS, family violence, 
victim and witness services, Aboriginal community controlled organisations and more. Thank you for watching. If you have any further questions or feedback, please contact the Centre for Innovative Justice at cij at rmit.edu.au. Uh, well, as you can see from uh, from that video, supportingjustice.net is a very well designed uh, website and I want to acknowledge and indeed congratulate the hard work of the design team at Paper Giant who worked with us to develop this uh, fantastic resource. I encourage you all now to get out your phones or if you're watching uh, on a work laptop or computer, go to your internet browser, uh, type in supportingjustice.net and bookmark that page. But it's now my great pleasure to uh, invite and introduce you to a close friend of mine and former colleague, the Honourable uh, Luke Donnellan, Member for Narry Warren North, Minister for Disability, Child Protection, Ageing and Carers. Uh, this is a bloke who uh, has social justice running through his veins and in the disability sector, he is making a difference, wants to continue to make a difference and it's a privilege for all of us to have uh, Minister Donnellan here to launch, officially launch the supportingjustice.net website. Welcome Luke. Uh, you're on mute. Always get the best answers. Can I, do. <laughs> I answer my own questions. But look, Woman Chica, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional lands of the land upon which we stand, pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future, and acknowledge them as the longest living civilization in the world. And um, obviously, with um, National Sorry Day, acknowledge the trauma that um, um, that the ongoing trauma that our um, Indigenous community lives with and that we need to continually um, acknowledge and work with in terms of our justice system. But uh, look, it's a great honour today, Rob, to um, be, I guess, um, being part of the launch of the Supporting Justice Net uh, website, um, supportingjustice.net website. Um, for me, as a Minister for Vulnerabilities, I guess I call it, in a sense, I've got many vulnerable cohorts. Um, we know these interventions we can do, whether it be in child protection system with out of home care kids, the numbers which are represented in the justice system, whether it be for our Indigenous community, but in this specific instance, it, it's for those with disabilities, which is again a large overrepresentation. So I'd like to acknowledge obviously our Magistrate Pauline Spencer, I know, um, has done enormous work in the community legal service area. We know that's the area which is really dealing with those who frequently miss out in justice and the opportunity to actually, I guess in a sense, have things dealt with properly. So um, I'd like to acknowledge Pauline. Also I'd like to acknowledge um, Emily Piggott from Valid, who um, I guess for me with Valid, you know that they're dripping with passion every time. Whenever they're coming to see you about a case, about an individual, the passion just, I don't know this sounds silly, but just oozes out of them because they are such passionate people and I, I um, have so much respect for Emily and the team at Bella because they do such marvellous work. I'd also like to acknowledge Dorothy, um, a survivor of domestic violence, um, um, a person who has um, is such a, a strong self-advocate for those people with acquired brain injury and, and obviously was an award winner last year, but it's, um, it's just recognition of the enormous work and great work you do for others, I guess, more than anything else. And I think that um, I haven't, um, read your full story. Um, that would probably upset me too much knowing me. I'm a bit of a sooky lala. My mum was child protection officer, so I must admit I never asked her too many questions. Better off I don't, but um, you obviously well deserved for the marvellous work you do in this space. Um, look, this is, um, this is a great project for me. Um, as I was saying before, we know when we intervene in an intelligent way, we get better outcomes in our community. We don't spend as much money in our justice system um, and we need to get in earlier. Um, that's sort of what really upsets me is that there are ways to minimise the impact on the humans. There are ways to minimise, let's be very blunt, um, I guess the financial impact upon a community by getting in early. You know, so why do we wait and then suddenly say, oh geez, we've got a whole lot of people with acquired brain injury in jail. We've got a whole lot of people from the child protection system that we just haven't intervened earlier. 
or we've got a whole lot of people from our indigenous community because we haven't got therapeutic interventions to deal with the enormous trauma these people have gone through. So this is a, I guess, a, a website which has been designed to actually, I guess, both educate the legal professionals, um, which is great in terms of their understanding of people with disabilities, and that's important. That's vital that they understand um, the capacities, the support they need to provide people through the courts. So that's good. But it's also necessary that those people with cognitive, cognitive disabilities are also able to get the information they need because the court system is you know, very complicated. I come from a, you know, one side of the family of lawyers, but you know, the court system is terrifying for most people. Um, but for a person with a cognitive disability, um, I can't imagine how difficult that must be. So I think you know, the fact that it's it's been put together by users with people with disabilities, with the legal system, the, the fact that there's a simple form called preparing for court form. I mean, what a logical thing to do is actually to provide the lawyers and the um, potential um, the magistrates or otherwise, but probably more the lawyers at this stage, um, to understand um, your person you're representing fully, not half baked understanding, but a full um, understanding of what, um, how you will need to support them through the court process, um, how they will um, respond to certain questioning, how they will respond to um, pressure so that we actually have the least restrictive options being considered for people in these instances, not the most restrictive options. So, um, look, I can only say, um, to be blunt, there's a lot of other areas in this space that um, we need interventions. And I, you know, being a minister for vulnerability, I know we're nowhere near where we should be. But geez, this is a, um, a great move forward. Um, and um, in many ways, I know that for Rob and his team, they'd rather have a fight than a feed, in a sense. And that's a fight over justice. You know, um, I've never seen anyone who's liked to fight more than Rob, um, but for the right reasons, not just for being a grumpy old bugger and liking a fight in itself, but because of this. So um, just want to congratulate the Senate for the work they've done, congratulate the team, including Stan and others there, uh, and congratulate um, both the legal, uh, uh, you know, um, obviously Magistrate Pauline Spencer and others, along with Emily and Dorothy for the work that everyone's come together to get this right because we know this will deliver better outcomes. And it's just a simple, it's just actually getting everyone together to have a, a bloody good think about what's required to be fair to everybody in this instance and get fair outcomes. So, um, you know, very happy to launch it and thank you for the great honour of being able to say a couple of words and now I'll listen and learn. Thanks so much, Luke. And we really do appreciate uh, your time in this very busy period. I love the way you describe yourself as the Minister for Vulnerability, uh, which is absolutely the work that we do at the Centre, uh, trying to assist the most vulnerable people who have contact with the justice system. And uh, and the words you talk, uh, you used about um, more appropriate therapeutic interventions and intervening earlier, and you're dead right, intervening earlier, saves stress, stay, saves uh, heartache and saves money. Um, so we all need to work more appropriately to intervene much earlier. Um, and uh, you're dead right, the, the justice system can be a horrifying experience for people who don't have a disability. Uh, and you put your shoes in, uh, your feet in the shoes of somebody who has a disability, you can imagine how terrifying the justice system is. And that's why we need people like you as Minister for Vulnerabilities and also a website such as the one that you've just launched. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're now going to move to our uh, panel discussion and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Her Honour Magistrate Pauline Spencer. Welcome Pauline. Hello everyone. Um, great to have you with us. Uh, we also have with us today Emily Pickett, um, as uh, Luke has already said, who is the Advocacy Coordinator for the Victorian Advocacy League for Intellectual Disability or VALID. Thanks very much for being with us, Emily. Thank you. Uh, joining us from the Centre for Innovative Justice, we have, as Luke said, uh, Victorian Disability Award winner Dorothy Armstrong, who is an advisor and peer worker on our Supporting Justice project and was instrumental in the development of this very important website. Welcome uh, Dottie and thanks for being with us. 
It's a pleasure, Rob. Thank you. And finally, to facilitate uh, the discussion today, we have Associate Director of the Centre for Innovative Justice, Stan Winford. Stan, thanks for being with us, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Rob, and uh, welcome to everyone who's watching this event. And thank you to the Minister, Minister Donnellan, who's been a great supporter of our work, uh, and we're very grateful that you've been able to launch the resource today, so thank you again. Um, I too wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, on which we're all uh, meeting uh, in various parts of Victoria and possibly Australia and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And also I want to acknowledge that today is National Sorry Day uh, and for members of the stolen generation for whom historical injustice has been an ongoing source of trauma, um, I just do want to acknowledge some of the work that our centre has been involved in and indeed the work of uh, the Minister's government in expunging criminal records which were given to members of the stolen generation as children when they are removed from their families. Um, and it's great to see that the government will also be introducing a spent conviction scheme um, later this year, which will go some way to addressing some of the challenges that we face in terms of um, reducing recidivism and uh, allowing people who've been uh, involved in past uh, criminal conduct to rehabilitate. Um, welcome to all of our panel panellists, Dorothy, Emily, Magistrate Paul and Spencer, who've also been supporters of our work along the way, uh, and many of whom have, or all of whom have contributed to the development of the resource. I'd like to start the discussion today um, by starting with the problem, uh, which is the lack of access to justice for people with disability. And access to justice can be thought of in lots of different ways, and it can relate to the way in which people access courts, it can relate to the way in which they're able to participate in uh, processes that affect them, including, um, you know, justice processes that take place in courts or in corrections or in prisons. Um, and I think first it's appropriate that we hear from Dorothy Armstrong, who's probably better placed than any of us to address this question based on her own experience. Dorothy, what do you see as the biggest barriers to access to justice for people with disability? Thank you, Stan. Uh, I think that's a really good question. and. I suspect that there are several answers, but I think uh, based on my experience, one of the biggest uh, problems was um, it was never recognised that I had an acquired brain injury or that I had any type of head injury. Um, and as I've shared before in different spaces, in spite of presenting, uh, you know, in front of magistrates or to police, you know, visibly, you know, beaten and, you know, experienced violence. Um, it was never considered or acknowledged that I potentially had some kind of, you know, head injury or brain damage. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Dorothy. I think um, your story really tells us a lot about how often uh, the signs of disability are missed or overlooked by people um, and those opportunities uh, are lost. And um, you know it can lead to ongoing contact, which is really unnecessary, and people can remain entrenched. Mm. Um, so thanks for that, Emily. If we want to address that issue, uh, and also if we want to address the overrepresentation of people with disability in the criminal justice system more broadly, where do you see the opportunities? Stan, I was just uh, just thinking about. Um what Dorothy was saying and just thinking about the way that we conceptualise things in society. And I suppose, you know, concepts of crime, disability and justice, justice are socially constructed ideas. And we've, you know, constructed pathologies around disability that disempowers and discriminates against people with cognitive disability. So we, we ask people with cognitive disability to mould themselves to the systems we've created for them rather than the systems being created to meet people's needs. I think in that sense, the justice system is probably incompatib incompatible with disability rights and disability politics and with the UNCRPD, um, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, sorry, because it's still a system that relies really heavily on clinical opinions to make legal decisions, and it's still invested in the medical model of disability. So it's 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 incompatible with our obligations under the UNCRPD, and it's incompatible with our human rights obligations in Victoria under our, our own charter, and it's also incompatible with the NDIS Act. And I think at, at valid 
uh, something that we frequently see, and, and we work specifically with intellectual disability, not um, other cognitive disability more broadly. But one of the things I suppose that we see frequent, frequently with the people that we work with is that uh, there, there are a whole lot of professional reactions to people around uh, that are based on assumptions around risk and behaviour and decision making and what a person's life should look like. And in those situations, um, the person with a disability has decisions made on their behalf. So we, we often find that when we become involved um, with those people, um, nobody's actually thought to ask the person what they want their life to look like. So the person often feels really disempowered and is often really inexperienced with making their own decisions, which then just reinforces the idea that they can't make their own decisions. And then this reinforces, again, the idea that the person uh, can't make their own decisions and therefore requires some sort of restriction. But we don't usually ask people how we can support people to to make their lives better. So we don't, you know, we're not we're not thinking about principles like self determination. Yeah. Thanks, so, Emily. Sorry, that was a very long winded answer. <laughs> no, no, it's, that's a very <laughs> thorough answer, and so many different issues there you've touched on, including how we can protect and promote the rights of people with disability within a system like the criminal justice system, which is not necessarily uh, sharing those aims in certain cases. Um, I thought I'd chip in here too with um, what I, through our project and working with others on supporting justice, uh, have come to see as some important areas for change. Um, I think obviously developing priorities through working with people with disability, understanding how they experience the system is a really good way to start in tackling these problems because so often um, the solutions that are prescribed are developed without their input. And, uh, you know, if 42% of men in our prisons have an acquired brain injury and very significant proportion of people in prisons generally have some form of cognitive impairment or um, disability, uh, something's not working. And one of the things that we haven't really tried to address this is to think about what it's like for people and what they might say would have helped them or what would have improved things for them. Through our work, we've uh, explored the causal links that are driving people into the criminal justice system and keeping them entrenched within it. And what we've found through that mapping process and through our work with people with disability and consulting others in the system is that there are really four areas that we think could uh, be tackled as priorities that might have the greatest impact in addressing the challenges that we face. We think that early intervention is really important and you know that's a bit of a catchword, but there are some really concrete examples of how that might work. And in the criminal justice system, it can mean diversion or um, opportunities, for example, for young people to access support earlier. Um, we think that disability and trauma awareness is really important. So people who work in the system need to better understand trauma and disability uh, and they need to get more access to people like Dorothy who are self-advocates who can really give them a much better understanding of what it's like and perhaps build a bit of you know, an empathy and understanding about what's going on for people. One of the things we also saw was that our system is very fragmented and often information that's held in one part of the system is not shared. Uh, and often parts of the system, if you could call it a system, don't collaborate. So we really think that cross-sector communication, information sharing uh, could be improved to drive better outcomes for people with disability in contact with the criminal justice system. There's just one example. There's a program that the Office of Public Advocate uh, delivers called the Independent Third Person Program, which is great in that it offers uh, support to people who come into contact with the police during an interview, but really it's a one-off and uh, there's no continuity there. That kind of program that could be strengthened to provide referral and support across the system and also to assist in um, much earlier identification and recognition of people with disability and their needs. Uh, because most of us know that um, for many people, and I think Dorothy, this is your situation too, yeah. they've been through the system and in and out of the system many, many times before anything's been picked up and anything uh, done to address their need for support and uh, anything done to sort of divert them away from that pathway. Finally, I think the fourth thing we've identified, which is really important, and this is probably not going to come as any surprise to anyone, it's housing. So 
Uh, there's just a need to increase pathways and to secure long-term housing for people with disability in contact with the criminal justice system. Uh, obviously, public housing uh, is in short supply. Um, we need more than is currently available. And what's important in relation to people with disability who've had contact with the criminal justice system, we think, is that um, it's not just about building, building capacity, it's also about the support associated with housing to maintain tenancies uh, and support during tenancy. So I think there's a real opportunity for more innovation in this space, uh, as well as uh, the good work that the government's already doing. Um, the next question uh, I'd like to ask is for Pauline. And obviously one of the points of contact that people traveling through the criminal justice system have is, is with uh, the courts and uh, lawyers. So Pauline, what role do you think courts and lawyers could play in supporting access to supports like the National Disability Insurance Scheme or other disability supports? Thanks, Stan. Uh, I think the value of the project um, for me has been, as Rob pointed out, hearing from people with lived experience of disability about what they need. And uh, really those three things that came out of the original Enabling Justice report that the Centre for Innovative Justice and Jesuit Social Services did, and Dorothy, you were part of that, and the Voices for Change group, uh, yeah. where people with lived experience talked about three things, um, recognition, respect and support. And for me, that's providing a, a map or for reform going forward for the courts. Um, if we think about recognition as the first point, uh, Dorothy very clearly says that recognition or the lack of recognition in your case, Dorothy, really led to a whole lot of uh, uh, injustices that flowed from it. And we need to have systems in place in our courts that recognise as early as possible for that early in intervention that, that, that a person has a disability that they may not even know they have themselves. Ask a few key questions at a few key moments. And one of the things the Magistrates Court of Victoria is, is thinking about at the moment is how can we better triage uh, our high volume of cases so that at the earliest point of contact, whether someone's walking through the door of the court or are in the cells um, on remand that we can triage, ask a few key questions and get them into the right level of support at the right time. Um, the second area then is respect. And the great thing about respect is it doesn't cost any money. It, it is a change in attitude and a change in, of approach. And uh, that's about respectful communication and uh, building the ability for people to participate. Uh, equally in the processes by giving them informed information so they can make informed decisions. And so I think there's a lot of work we can do around uh, uh, educating people to be disability aware and trauma informed. Um, both the lawyers, the prosecutors, the security staff at, uh, at the front of the court, right through to the magistrates. And what's wonderful about the supportingjustice.net uh, resources that it does provide a lot of really great resources for effective communication to build that respect. And then the third aspect of that map uh, that the people with lived experience have talked about is support. There's no point in recognising, there's no point in respecting if you don't follow through with support. And what's been interesting, there's a, a great researcher, Eileen Baldry, who talks about people with disability actually being caught up in agencies of control that their compliance and control and they're just pulled into the system. And we see it as magistrates, people just that inevitable slide into, into prison because they're not being provided with the, what Eileen Baldry talks about, the agencies of support. So they're being tied up in this system of agencies of control and not given the right support at the right time to change the trajectory of their life. So um, the support's really important and at court, we know that that point of crisis can be an invaluable time for support to be provided. And what we have in our courts through the, the great work of people like Yelena Popovic and other magistrates and successive governments along the way, supporting the expansion of therapeutic jurisprudence in our courts through court support programs like the KISS, the Court Integrated Services Program, and the wonderful work that the court support workers do, but also for people with more complex needs, the assessment and referral courts that exist. 
they exist in pockets uh, throughout the state. What we'd like to see as a court that no matter what postcode you're in, that you have that triage, that mainstream support, and if your needs are complex, that special special support with the assessment and referral court, so that that con continuity of service for different types of needs is available across the state wherever you are. So that's the sort of thing we're thinking, and it's been great for me to have that map provided by the people with lived experience to actually help me conceptualise where we need to go from here. Thanks, Pauline. Um, I, I think that's absolutely right, and I'm really pleased that you've come back to the enabling justice report and those three things, recognition, respect and support, because I do think they sum, sum it all up in, in many ways. Um, and certainly sort of the idea of recognition, for example, is just so critical in relation to people with acquired brain injury who um, you know, were experiencing what was pretty much an invisible disability. And interestingly, that term, we, we use that because the word identification was often used. So people were saying, oh, you need to identify who these people are and you need to assess them. But so often um, nothing really happened after that. There wasn't a response that followed the assessment and recognition was a different concept, which was, you know, thinking about in terms of following through. Um, Dorothy, um, I think you're on mute, but you had a response you'd like to add to, to that there. Thank you, Stan. Emily did also. I actually just wanted to to say at this point, um, it's really important for me to let people know that, you know, the woman that you see and hear today is not is not the woman that I've always been. I have certainly had um, numerous experiences in my life where I've been nonverbal because I've had such damage, you know, to my brain that I've been unable to communicate. So I'm aware that I may, you know, present okay and that I you know, I, I'm in a much better space than what I have been, but this is not how I have been always. I have presented to police nonverbal. I have been nonverbal, you know, in the justice system. And, you know, one of the words that has been used, which is very true for me, it's beyond terrifying. Um, one, to be injured, uh, to not be able to communicate and to be at the mercy of people like police who have such power, uh, you know, over human beings. So I really just wanted to let people know that, that this is not how I've always been, you know. Yeah. Thanks, Dorothy. Um, I thought, sorry, Emily, did you want to say something? I was just um, picking up on, on what on what Pauline was saying and about those those themes that came out and, and about respect. I think more, perhaps more broadly, inclusion is a principle that's really important. So, you know, just across society in general, uh, it's an entitlement for people with cognitive disability to be included, and it's our obligation to make reasonable adjust, adjustments for those people to be included. And I suppose in the court system that there's huge opportunities for inclusion uh, because not only is it an, an entitlement for people, but it also kind of creates a natural safeguard that as soon as you open people's lives up to more services, to mainstream services being involved and making adjustments, you're actually ensuring that people can't become trapped in the, you know, the dark corners of the justice system. You, 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 you can open up some of those closed systems, I suppose, that that Eileen Baldry talks about. The other thing I was thinking about is that, you know, within the criminal justice system, we don't really have any rights-based platforms for for people with cognitive disability. So we need you know, things like independent advocacy and self-advocacy programs and, and proper safeguarding mechanisms within the justice system. And of course, I would say that we need advocacy in the justice system, being an advocate. <laughs> um, and I think I think as well, you know, we, we there's a lot of people who go through the justice system, not necessarily with a cognitive disability, but lo lots of people, but especially people who experience disability who've had a lot of their decision-making rights taken away from them at various stages in their lives, and particularly people with intellectual disability who've had institutional lives, that you know their whole life has been characterised by lack of decision-making. And so we have a huge opportunity to kind of inject self-determination into the justice system through supporting people to make decisions. And we might start off with, you know, quite small decisions, but actually getting that practice 
and, and getting people to become better at advocating for themselves and to be, being able to talk about what they want. And I know that this is something that Pauline's done in court and Pauline and I have had a conversation about, you know, the things that she does in court face to face with people to work out what people want, which, which you know, that kind of stuff I think is fantastic. Thanks very much, Emily. Um, I might just mention to the audience that we're going to have some time for Q&As at the end. So if you start to think of things now is a good time to start uh, sending them through um, and we'll, we'll allow a bit of time for responding to those. So get them in now and if um, if they're popular, uh, then we'll probably be able to cover them. Um, just to wrap up the panel discussion, um, the last question I want to ask, and this is for all of the panellists, uh, is really bring it back to some, I guess, a bit more practical tips or suggestions for how uh, people, you know, whether they're lawyers or judges or support workers, can better respond to people with disability in the criminal justice system. Um, and I think, uh, Pauline, if if I might, I'll start with with you. Have you got any uh, examples or ideas? And I think you're on mute at the moment, so. Um. I think the uh, that respect area is is something that judicial officers can really start working on right now and I know a lot of my colleagues who've already heard about the supportingjustice.net uh, website have had a look and are starting to apply some of these practices in court already which is great um, and it's about your court craft it's about how you communicate in court and it uh, sometimes people go well I haven't got time for that because I'm in a busy list but I found it's actually more effective that if you are actually communicating more effectively, you get through the work quicker. And it's also much more rewarding um, to work in a, a, a TJ, a therapeutic jurisprudence way as a judge is much more rewarding uh, because you do have better and more effective conversations in court. And as uh, Emily said, you know, the simple question of what do you need right now? Um, I find asking that simple question uh, opens up uh, a whole lot of things that you may not have even understood um, and uh, and also gives people uh, trust that you're actually caring and listening to what they think and that then opens up a whole, that rapport opens up a whole lot of ability to um, work on some um, behavioural change. And, you know, we all know if we, someone's going like this to us, we're not going to change our behaviour. We, we may be put up with it, we not smile and nod, but we don't really change. But if we actually ask people, what do you need? What do you want to do next? Um, then people actually take some ownership over their rehabilitation. So this is not only about helping the person, but it's about if we're really serious about community safety, um, this is about helping people change behaviour and live better lives. Great, thanks. Thanks, Pauline. Um, Emily, any final comments or tips from you as an advocate uh, who supports people with disability in these kinds of processes? I think um, what, one of the things that happens a lot for people in the justice system is that it's really mystifying. You go through and you're kind of splattered with a whole lot of legal terminology uh, and processes that are really difficult to, uh, to comprehend. So I think often it's really good for people to kind of reframe what they're doing in terms of um, the person's disability related entitlement. Um, so it's not patronising or a waste of time to carefully explain things to people or to or to make to make an adjustment so that they have the opportunity to understand what's going on around them. And it's it, the person's entitled to understand the concepts and particularly the orders that are being made. Um, you know, obviously don't use a loud voice or speak slowly, but do explain things even if it takes longer. Um, and and I think also it's really important that just as a matter of course. Um, people are asked what their support needs are. And, and I'm not saying you assume that every person who who comes into court or go, goes into the justice system has a disability, disability, but also don't assume that they don't. Um, and, you, you know, people, people who are involved in the justice system can lead that practice around, you know, normalising support needs, which I think is really important. Yeah, thanks, Emily. And Dorothy, I think you're on mute as well, but um, I think both what what both Emily and uh, Pauline have said reminds me of what you've always said, which I found pretty powerful. What was it like when you went to court and dealt with lawyers and what could have been better for you? We don't have enough time, Stan. <laughs> um, I, I absolutely agree with what, um, with what Pauline and Emily said and the communication, just talking and asking 
very simple questions and for the court professionals to acknowledge that the court uh, the court system is your world. It's not the world um, mentally or physically job wise of the people that you're seeing. So unless there's a change in language so that the people that you're dealing with can understand what is going on, I think it's a bit of a stretch to have the expectation of somebody like myself to do something, you know, directed that way. I think really quite simply is just be respectful and ask some really simple questions like Pauline said. That's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Dorothy. Um, yeah, I remember very well when you said no one ever asked me, you know, how did I get here and mm. what, what do I need? And I thought mm. that's very true that all these things go on around people and um, that simple question can unlock so, so much potential in terms of um, understanding what your needs are and and responding to them appropriately. Um, so we've now got uh, 12 minutes or so for questions and a number of people have been publishing them uh, in the Q&A uh, box on the side. So if the uh, other panelists could open that up, they'll be able to see those there. And um, I'll, I'll read some of them out and um, perhaps direct them to people, um, but people equally if they want to answer them can can jump in or, or wave their arms around vigorously and I'll throw to you. Um, Dorothy, I'll go to you with this one. Um, Kelly's asked, what was the design process like for people involved in creating the resource and what, what did you learn from this experience? That's a really, um, that's a really good question. Kelly, thank you for asking it. Um, again, I don't think I have the time to to talk about um, a lot of my learnings, but one of the biggest things, Stan, you referenced the systems map, which I'm aware hasn't been shown, but it was one of the things that the Centre for Innovative Justice did actually create. Um, and for me, when I first saw that, I was so completely overwhelmed to see a visual of um, what the justice system looks like and what it's like for somebody traveling through it. Um, and one of the things that I felt quite immediately was a great, there it is, thank you. That's the map I'm talking about. Good luck uh, reading that yeah. writing. <laughs> yes, um, but it actually, it helped me to have so much more empathy and compassion for the people that work in the system. Like I can only ever talk about my experiences and the way that I've been affected by them. But looking at something like this, all of the all of the professionals working in that system, it just it caused me to have, as I said, so much more empathy and understanding for them um, and the position that they're in. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, I learned a lot from participating in that process too, and I, I, I don't have time to go through all the things I learned, but one of the really interesting mm. things I learned was um, how to ask people about their disability in a respectful way. And I always felt kind of awkward about doing it and, um, and not quite understanding why people might be cagey about it too. And what I found was that um, people with disability have been through the criminal justice system can be exploited because of their disability. And so when you're asking someone about their disability, um, you've got to do it in a way that explains to them why you want to know. And uh, also that helps them um, get a sense of what the benefits are for them of disclosing that. So often disclosures can be used in ways that are harmful to people. So it's completely understandable that people won't necessarily immediately start listing what the issues are that they face. Pauline, um, have you got a got a comment you'd like to make there? Yeah, just uh, people sometimes uh, say like they've been assessed so many times that nothing actually flows from that. So mm. I think the recognition is very important and triage and assessment is very important, but we do need to make sure as a system we're backing it up with the right support uh, because you know it's very frustrating for people. They say they've had 
you know, assessed here, assessed here, assessed here, and they still don't have the support that they need to turn their lives around. So it's very important that we think about this as a package uh, that you need both the recognition, the respect and the support. Yeah, exactly. So why, why would you disclose something if it really doesn't go anywhere and doesn't deliver anything for you? Um, there's a couple of comments here from Eleni who says, I have lived experience of the criminal justice system my whole life. Others made decisions for me, so I had no idea how to speak up for myself. I've since learned this, so I agree. Advocacy and self-advocacy are needed. I had no contact with the system prior to this and did not understand any of the terminology and was frightened to ask. Um, Emily or Dorothy, do you want to respond to that? <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to, Dorothy. <laughs> Um, Eleni, that absolutely fan, fantastic, fantastic comment. Um, I think one of the things that we miss often is that there, there are there are things that a lot of people take for granted, like decision making, uh, and we, you know, a lot of people take decision making for granted as a right that we have, and yet we also know that there are lots of people who become involved in the justice system who don't have that right, and we don't see decision making as a really complex nuanced process we sort of see it as this this weird static snap thing so i think for people going through the justice system you know we're, we're asking so much of people you know throwing so much information at people and then asking people to make informed decisions based on information that's you know incomprehensible to the majority of people so i think you know and and of course i would agree that advocacy and self-advocacy is really important but but i genuinely think that it is because we have the opportunity to to help um, that group of people become more empowered to ask questions, demand information, demand adjustments to the way information is given to them, and to seek support for decision making. So that so that you know the export the experts don't always assume that they're making poor decisions and use that as a justification for restriction and control. Thanks, Emily. Do you have anything to add to that, Dorothy? You're on mute at Mark. Thank you, Stan. Probably um, just to uh, agree with what Emily said, and, and I really appreciate, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, the woman who shared that experience, and I very much relate to that. And um, yeah, I think initially it does need to start with um, advocacy and self advocacy, because as you've mentioned, Stan, you know, based on my experience and, and having been to prison, it's it's a very frightening thing to know that there, for me anyway, knowing that I had an acquired brain injury, that there is no way on earth that I was going to let, you know, women in prison or any officers know about that. So even in the process of talking with your solicitor or, or you know, listening to your solicitor, and if it's, and if it's not somebody, um, that you have a relationship with and there is though there are those fears of not not asking what do you mean or you know what's going on um yeah just so much more difficult so i agree with what's been said yeah advocacy and self-advocacy yeah. thanks dorothy um pauline there's a question from an occupational therapist here who's sort of saying i don't know if you can see it there that um, in her experience, some lawyers resist assessments that might identify cognitive disability because they're worried it will result in a harsher sentence because magistrates might assume that um, a person with a disability is less capable of behaviour change. Any thoughts on that uh, question? Uh, I think this is a, a, a valid point. Um, our legal system, so it, when we take a therapeutic jurisprudence approach, we look at uh, the laws themselves and the legal processes and the roles of the legal actors within the system and think how can we improve those aspects to improve the well-being of people. And I think uh, there is some recognition in the law that uh, where there is mental impairment, so mental health issues or cognitive impairment, that that can be taken into account in uh, sentencing to moderate uh, the, the sentence that might otherwise be imposed on a person who doesn't have those characteristics. So um, there's certainly uh, an education piece about uh, how we need to work differently at law 
with people with uh, mental health issues and cognitive impairment. And, uh, and I think uh, systems like the supportingjustice.net website uh, as a training tool is these resources are really important to, to get that message out there. Thanks very much, Pauline. And there's a couple of questions that we don't have time to get to that sort of relate to how we how we'll make this resource more widely available to people in prisons or in other jurisdictions, because it's currently primarily focused on resources in Victoria. Um, and those are questions that we'll respond to um, perhaps uh, in other ways, but stay tuned. And um, thank you for all your uh, contributions. It was a really great discussion. Um, I'd like to pass it back to Rob now um, to wrap up uh, for today's event. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Stan. And uh, hasn't the word respect come through uh, through every one of our presenters? Um, uh, it's pretty clear and it's not rocket science, like just show respect for people who come into contact with the justice system. I've got to say, Dorothy, I loved uh, your comment, uh, particularly addressed really at people who work within the justice system, that the court system is your world. It's not the world of people with a disability. So please change your language. Uh, put your language in everyday terms that we uh, with a disability and without a disability can better understand. Um, and uh, I, I love uh, the comments um, that uh, have been made uh, also by you, Emily, in relation to just don't assume don't assume that people don't have a disability um, and the system will work much better if you don't make those sort of assumptions. Uh, look, in wrapping up, I want to thank uh, Luke Donnellan. Luke has just left us uh, and he sent me a message saying uh, fantastic and he's um, learned a hell of a lot from the panel discussion today. So he was thrilled to be with us uh, and it's fantastic that he was able to be with us. Um, the thought provoking discussion of the panel has been fantastic. Um, uh, and uh, I want to thank everyone in our audience for being with us today. For those of you who haven't already done so, please head to coj.org.au and sign up for our newsletter to be kept up to date on similar events and project updates from the Centre for Innovative Justice. Uh, I'll conclude by um, thanking everybody for joining us today. I want to wish everybody um, safety and good health until we're able to see each other in person in the not too distant future. Bye for now.